What inspired you to write the Declaration of Independence? The French and Indian War in America and the French Regent's War of Spanish Succession led into rampant mercantilism, an existentialist's nightmare, which devalued any sound reason applied to the pursuit of practicality or moral measures whence violent conflicts emerged. The beasts of burden, which prey on the less fortunate of society, were always left with a great scavenger hunt of flesh, bullet and bone after the hierarchy of Europe dredged out its war drums. This left the colonies with more defeatism than harvest as the calendrical rounds of tax collection compounded into an indiscernible avarice, with no regard for the subject matter or objective manners involved. What little operating clarity remained to men at arms made it clear that the British Parliament's unintelligible actions demanded a declaration of independence which discounted our produce, tribute and loyalty to its unvirtuous ways. To be effective it had to be drastic, it need to be an affront to the king's claim as sovereign, a declaration of war conducted by its own colonies. How did you become the first Democratic Republic president? The ideological and philosophical differences between a democratic state and a republic are profound in historical record. Formed in 1791, James Madison and I had opposed the policies of Treasury Secretary Alexander Hamilton and his Federalist Party which we in the Democratic Republican Party saw as weakening state rights and misinterpreting our Constitution. The largest difference between our parties was our views on foreign policy and the economy. The Federalists believed that foreign policy should favor British interests and strongly supported the Jay Treaty with Britain, while we Democratic Republicans wanted to strengthen ties with the French, who we saw as more democratic after its recent revolution. On economic matters, we Democratic Republicans believed in protecting the interests of the working classes through the promotion of an agrarian economy and saw the establishment of a National Bank of the United States, which Hamilton strongly favored as a means of usurping power that belonged to individual states. The Federalists saw industry and manufacturing as the best possible means of domestic growth and economic self-sufficiency and favored the existence of protective tariffs both as a means of protecting domestic production and as a source of revenue. During our party's existence we dominated Congress and sent four candidates to the presidency. By 1824, however, we lacked a cohesive center and most members gravitated towards the Democratic Party under Andrew Jackson, the people's president, who had our national debt to its lowest point in history. What did liberty mean to you? The chiefest good in ladylike grace, it was common law in the new world. Instead of the self-serving practices of British Parliament, liberty served the homestead. Philosophically, politically, what risks did you notice from the Federalists' view of economic practice? A meddlesome one, unconstitutional in times of war and in times of peace flourished, the Federalists saw it as his own accomplishment instead of the harmony of a civil society. In fact, if I hadn't known Hamilton for his principles, I would think him a royalist with a fancy for hierarchy and unquestioned servitude for a natural elite which still delegated on behalf of the king and collected taxes without representative limitations or context. In all, the Federalist mindset was one gear and pinion short of a machine that sought to increase our young republic's economic capabilities with the paper schemes of Boolean logic and printing value dictation. However, it wasn't long before the inequalities manifest in such practice, made clear the unconstitutional aspects of distinct elite and labor classes. Distinctions that would be nominal and hierarchical in England, could not sink deep enough roots of deference into our nascent republic, so before any lord could swallow the land whole and cash all the furs for his own kin, a regular and recurring social netting grew along estate borders and trade routes. This thorough mixing of the people and common law practice of supply and demand allowed for a more liberal society, one of individual opportunity and craft in public education a more virtuous and less demanding routine. Being free and equal as people, did not necessarily extend into each person however, so our governing concepts were malleable, offering us a chance to produce structures of office balanced with merit and checked by the transparency of public interest, 
policy, and our inherited mistrust for political power. What did the vote mean to patriots like yourself? The vote signaled a man's inference and moral conscience in one simple act, so that one's preference wasn't utilized in selection of benefits incurred or promised. On the contrary, the overall dynamic of a candidate's character was to be utilized in administrative capacities for the benefit of all citizens, thus, allowing the voter to find within their own hearts and minds, a just representative to elect. I do believe it was our dear Thomas Paine who so expressed with savvy, the duty of a patriot is to protect his country from his government. 